Hello and welcome back to Rural Health for you and everybody. I'm Amber Sorensen, the Marketing Director at the Murray County Medical Center, and I'm here with Tom Bergman, one of our Rural Health Clinic providers. Hello, Tom. How are you? Good morning. Very good. Good. So, as some of you may know, Tom is on his way out of MCMC, unfortunately, and we wish him well in his future endeavors, but he wanted to do one last podcast episode to talk about a variety of different health topics that may be of benefit to some of our listeners. So just to start off with, Tom, for those who haven't listened to an episode, why don't you give a brief introduction of yourself? Sure. I, uh, <clears throat> I've been here for, oh, I don't know, a couple years, not very long. Um, <clears throat> ultimately, I, I really have enjoyed my time here. It's been a great learning experience. Um, it's a wonderful facility. And it's just a family decision as far as why we're going to head over to the Rochester area. So um, there's an excellent new doctor. His name is Dr. Goldhammer. Um, we get along pretty well. Um, I think I respect his opinion and as well as uh, a, a number of other providers. Also, Dr. Snow is leaving as well, which is unfortunate. Um, but we have a, a full squad that can, can meet everyone's needs. Um, so as far as uh, topics, I have a, a variety of things that are somewhat by request, apparently. Um, so I'll, I'll just kind of go down the list here in no particular order, if you don't mind. Sure. Um, let's see here. So uh, um, blood pressure. Um, very common to have this be somewhat of an issue for a lot of folks. Um, one of the main reasons, well, there's several reasons, but one of the main reasons is um, high sodium diets or uh, consuming a lot of processed foods, like things in cans. You know, not so much the salt shaker, it's more of uh, processed things, stuff in cans, like I said, um, pancakes, you know, a lot of breakfast foods have a lot of sodium in it. Sodium tends to hold on to water in our bodies, which will raise our blood pressure. So um, things that you can do to improve your, your blood pressure, obviously diet and exercise, we all know that. Um, if it turns out that you need a medication, Typically what we do <clears throat> is look at um, any other medications you may be on or any other health concerns you may have and there are several to choose from and we pick you know the best one based on our discretion and essentially what happens is, is you, you start on a low dose, you monitor your pressure for a week or so, you come back in and if it's, if it's stable or where we want it to be, which is in the Oh, 120s for the top number or so, 70s or 80s for the bottom number. Um, if it's stable, then we need to get a lab test to look at our electrolytes, make sure nothing's getting goofed up. Sometimes that happens. If, if anything is amiss, then we just make adjustments. Um, if you're on this medicine for you know a week or two and the, the, your pressure is not well controlled, then we titrate the dose. Um, it's very common. Sometimes this is a multi-week or month process, so um, you know, don't be real surprised about that. And then typically we like people to come in <clears throat> once a year um, for lab work and just to kind of you know follow things. So um, blood pressure, very common um, thing to, to have um, elevated or needs a little attention and, and Everyone here does it all the time, and um, we can certainly answer any questions that you may have uh, regarding that. And the re well, I guess the reason that we <clears throat> want to keep blood pressure to a, a good number is because it's basically just more more pressure on your organs and your vessels, and um, it, you know it, it adds to to wear and tear over time. Um, a lot of times, people will come in that are asymptomatic, you know, that that have uh, kind of incidental findings of high blood pressure and we adjust it um, from there. So there are some symptoms that can be associated with high blood pressure, such as headaches or visual changes, um, palpitations, there's a number of different things that can exist. Um, so if there are any concerns, obviously you know where to find us. Um, and a lot of times it is kind of an incidental, incidental finding, but um, well, we certainly can walk you through all of that. 
And you mentioned lab tests involved with that. Can most and or all of those be completed here on site at MCMC? Yep, all of them. Cool. It's just one. It's a, it's a, it's called a BMP. It looks at electrolytes and kidney function, a couple different things. Very simple. It comes back really quickly. Cool. Um, so another topic I have, I think I might have talked about this at one point, is, is uh, penicillin um, allergies tend to run into this a lot. We see it in the people's charts. Um, <clears throat> I don't know the stats off the top of my head. It's something like 90% of people that have a, a penicillin allergy is not technically an allergy. It's more of a side effect that you can get if you have a certain virus and you take penicillin at the same time or a penicillin product. And, um, you know, especially with kids, if we see a penicillin allergy, it kind of limits um, a, a variety of antibiotics that we like to use for common conditions. And if it's not truly a, um, an allergy, you know, something that could be done is either we can do them here, uh, penicillin challenges, or you can do them at an allergist setting in, in perhaps Sioux Falls. But uh, we've done them here before. Basically, if we don't have a real high suspicion that it's a true allergy, it's more of a side effect. You know, if a person hadn't had um, anaphylaxis or a, a major reaction. Um, we have um, come into the office, give them a small amount of penicillin in certain increments of time over the course of about an hour and we just monitor vitals and, and watch. And if there's going to be a bad allergic reaction, usually it happens within the first few minutes or first you know, couple hours. You can get delayed um, hypersensitivity reactions that can pop up even a week later, but more often than not, those are not severe anaphylaxis, you know, life-threatening type things. But regardless, um, it would be nice to, you know, if you have a penicillin allergy, really um, confirm that, um, and we can do it here. And what <clears throat> ages, I guess, of kids would that generally entail? It can be kids, adults, it doesn't, the age doesn't really matter. Um, it is nice if we're gonna if we're gonna test a child that's you know of an age where they can express how they're feeling. So like five six years old, um, you know that that would be ideal. We're not gonna do this to a, an infant, of course, but you know even if you're 20 or 50 or however old and you have a penicillin allergy, if you're not absolutely sure, um, that would be something that would be nice to test. You know, because like I said. Sometimes there are some pretty gnarly infections that require a certain penicillin product, and if you have an allergy, we got to go to Plan B, and that's not um, always ideal. And is that test generally done? I guess I'm thinking of like allergy tests and whatnot, but is the penicillin given uh, like orally yeah. or more like an allergy test where it like pokes into your arm or whatever? No, you can give it orally. Um, you give a small amount at first, right? And you kind of pay attention to how a person does with it and how they handle it and monitor their vitals very closely. And it's a specific thing, you know, we, we um, take it very seriously, but you know, a lot of times, like I said, it's, it's it had been more of a side effect. And um, you know, the percent chance of it actually being a true allergy is very low. Um, so it's, it's just nice to, to try to identify that. So if that's what's, something that you think you have and you want to get it taken care of, it's a simple appointment. Set it up here. Um, it can be done anytime. Sounds good. Um, so, just going down the list here. Um, ER versus clinic visits. So, <clears throat> um, the emergency room is meant for exactly that, emergencies. If you have something that can be dealt with in the clinic, it is preferable that it gets set up that way. Um, you know, there's, there's many things that get seen in the emergency room that are not really emergencies and they can tie up the, the staff down there um, sometimes inappropriately. So we like to encourage people, if, if it can wait to make an, a clinic appointment, um, get seen that way. It just keeps things streamlined and, and um, you know, it, it's just nice to go to where it's appropriate and, um, you know, a lot of times you know, we, we can we can squeeze people in in the clinic if there's something that's somewhat pressing but not an emergency. You know, um, most providers here are more than willing to um, to make some adjustments. So, um, 
Um, if it's not an emergency, save it for the clinic if at all possible. That would be nice. And we're getting into, I guess, the winter, possibly, and cold and flu season. There may be some people listening that maybe they have like small children, uh, fevers, that sort of thing. I guess, are there any general guidelines that you'd say for going to the emergency room in those types of situations sure. versus clinic? Well, specifically now, it feels like most people in the county have some sort of cold. Um, you know, it's not always the flu, it's not always COVID. There's a bunch of viruses that can cause very similar symptoms, but generally, <clears throat> Um, things to look out for that warrant clinic or emergency room visits, specifically for like children, you're asking, right? Um, work of breathing. So if a child is, is struggling, taking big breaths, can't really, you know, um, seem to calm down, I mean, that's, that's a pretty good instance of needing um, um, relatively urgent assessment and care. You know, there's a lot of people that use inhalers or, or nebulizers with albuterol or, or something similar to that. It doesn't always work super well if you don't have really a, a, a reactive airway. So if you do it and it doesn't seem to have any improvement, you don't have to keep doing it. Um, there is an indication to use it for cough as well as shortness of breath and, and asthmatic type things. But just use your discretion. I mean, you know, albuterol specifically is, is good at raising our heart rate. So if you know, if you don't see a, an improvement with the use, you don't have to schedule it. Um, so use discretion. Um, as far as other little kids, uh, you know, runny nose, um, they make these um, bulb suction units or like the, uh, <laughs> I call them snot suckers. There's like the, these tubes that you can <laughs> suck uh, nasal secretions from. Um, that do that work pretty well, um, especially for like real little kids. Um, elevating the head of the bed or the crib, you know, if you're laying flat, you know, it's just a matter of time before some of the um, uh, nasal secretions kind of sneak down the back of the throat, and they can cause lots of cough and different different things with that. Um, there's not a lot of good medicines that are approved for real little kids. Um, you know, they, there's a, a variety of kind of herbal over-the-counter things that you can try for um, stuffy or runny nose. Um, but essentially, it's, it's the, the suction. Um, sometimes you can use antihistamines, you know, like a Claritin, and sometimes dry secretions. Um, but otherwise, it's just a lot of, you know, waiting and out, essentially. I wish I had a better answer, but, you know, that, that's, that's basically what it is. Um, unless there is some form of respiratory distress or real high fever or if our oral intake is not very good, you know, um, those are the things you kind of watch for. <clears throat> uh, let's see here. I've got a few other topics. Should I just keep going? Sure. All right. Vitamins. Um, yes. Uh, a lot of vitamins, um, well, you kind of have to look at them as water-soluble versus fat-soluble. So the fat-soluble ones are A, D, E, and K, and those can build up in our system over time if we take piles of them. Um, you know, it's nice to, to supplement vitamin D, for instance, um, but there is kind of a, an upper limit of normal. You want to pay attention to what you're taking and, and not take more than what you're supposed to. Um, most labels of, of vitamin supplements will have kind of a expected what's normal dosing um, and try to stick to that to some extent. There's a lot of other supplements that are out there. Um, for instance, AG1, you know, there, there's a bunch of different things that are supposed to be helpful for memory or for energy or um, different things. But long story short, um, a lot of vitamins, you know, that exist now are available easily and you're not going to get a lot of testing done on them because there's just not a lot of money in it. Um, so as far as literature that we uh, utilize and share with patients, it's just never going to exist. So I'm, I'm a believer in kind of anecdotal evidence. You know, if, if you try something for a while, you know, just make sure it's from a, um, a, a company that kind of has something to lose. If you're if you're ordering some random you know, 
supplement from who knows where. You know, they, they don't have to tell you what's actually in the supplement. They can put on the label whatever they want. And it's not necessarily going to be what's in the capsule. There's just not a lot of testing done for it. So if you use like a GNC product or something that's, you know, somewhat major, you know, they're, they're more likely to be a little more um, responsible with, with kind of how they, they package their things. So, um, but there's just a lot to choose from and, and you know, you can look a lot of this up and, and kind of get information on, you know, what it's supposedly doing, but you know, I do think you know, we get a lot of vitamins and things from a good diet, but you can supplement and um, it can be effective. It's just you need to do your homework. Um, <clears throat> let's see here. Oh, uh, energy drinks. That's another topic. Um, energy drinks, again, you kind of have to look at the label. Um, well, there's a lot that have a ton of sugar in them, and those are not really great for you. But otherwise, for the most part, they're full of B vitamins and, and a little bit of caffeine. That's probably um, a little bit less than what Amber is drinking in her coffee right now. They're, they're really relatively safe. Um, you know, you don't want to drink five of them a day or anything. But, you know, if you look at the label, make sure it's got minimal to no sugar. Um, but otherwise, like I said, a lot of a lot of B vitamins, and it's okay. It's just if you're consuming a ton of them, it makes your kidneys work, and um, you just don't want to get carried away uh, with that. Let's see, what other things have we got? Oh, exercise. <laughs> How much time do we got here, Amber? All the time in the world. <laughs> so exercise um, is fantastic for you, and pretty much most capacities and um, people should do some form of that every day you know it's, it's not always realistic so if it's a few times a week that's better than nothing um, by far you know if, if you're you know for instance watching your weight and your dieting and, and things you still need to exercise our bodies are made to move you got to do it um, whether it's walking, running, lifting weights, different things, there's tons of stuff to choose from. And if it's, you know, 15 minutes a day or an hour and 15 minutes, I mean, something is better than nothing. And it needs to be scheduled. And nobody really enjoys it, for the most part, <laughs> I've found. Um, but it's just something if you get in a habit of doing, you'll find that you'll feel better, um, you'll sleep better. Um, it's just, it's essential, it really is. And that, you know, as far as uh, I would say um, a healthcare community, I mean, we're all going to agree that it's pref preferable to um, advise healthcare as opposed to sick care. They're different. Um, being proactive is very important, and exercise is, is part of that. And um, you know, we just need to take it seriously, and um, it, it's it's what we were made to do. So um, I could belabor the point for a long time, but um, it, it is very important, and it's, it's, I don't, I think it's neglected to some extent with a lot of people. So, um, let's see, what else do I have? Oh, headache, headaches uh, slash dementia. Um, hmm, kind of a broad topic. Um, you know, we, we, I think, as we get older, we kind of worry, or I've heard people wonder about, you know, my memory isn't what it used to be, or, you know, I, I forget where I put my keys kind of thing. Um, I would say that's pretty normal. If you're, you know, watching a movie four days in a row and can't remember that you've watched it, that's a different thing. Um, you know, there, there, there really isn't a, a specific lab test um, for memory or um, Alzheimer's, you know, things like that. There's imaging that can be done, you know, because if you're having memory issues, headaches, you know, different focal neurologic deficits, we certainly can do, you know, scans of your, of your brain and, and look for space occupying lesions or um, there's different qualities that you can kind of see in certain conditions, but um, a lot of it you, you, you really can't see. And, um, you know, there, there's causes for that, you know, um, I think there's age-related things, there's genetics, 
Um, if we take certain medications like benzodiazepines or narcotics, you know, that is associated with dementia if you use it for a long period of time. So we try to um, encourage people not to do that. Um, you know, certain vitamin deficiencies, like we talked about before, um, can be associated with, with that as well. So um, having a good diet, exercising, I mean, all, that's, that's good for not only just weight loss, but, you know, heart and brain health um, as well. Um, but if you're concerned about these things and it doesn't seem to be normal, um, certainly, you know, we can, we can do assessments here, um, different scans. I mean, there's, there's different medications that can sometimes slow the progression of memory loss. Um, you know, they don't necessarily reverse, reverse it or cure it, um, but they do exist. So um, if that's something that, that bothers you, certainly we can, we can um, evaluate you for that. Let's see here. Anything else that you can think of? I feel like I can kind of... Hmm. I don't know. You got any <clears throat> parting words of wisdom? Oh, it's, uh, one more topic. Stress. <laughs> ah, yes. Um, <clears throat> I think all of us have that to some extent, right? It's just, uh, you know, what I tell people is, does it affect your life? You know, does it affect your sleep or your function, your day-to-day -day things? If it does, then, um, you know, there, there's therapy for that. There's medications for that. Um, there's different strategies that we could discuss that can help it as well. Um, but it's kind of a broad topic. You know, there's, there's as far, from a medication standpoint, there's a lot to choose from. And they have relatively equal effectiveness. It's just person to person, it's a little different. So if you're having struggles in this area and you come in and you try medication X and it doesn't quite do what you're expecting it to do over the course of several weeks, then we switch to the next one. And, you know, that's just how you figure it out is um, kind of trial and error, um, essentially. But... Um, eventually you probably will find something that's effective for you and um, you know I tell people you know medication can be effective therapy can be effective as well but neither one is better than both of them together if that makes sense so um, you know, we like to um, encourage people to, to do what's best and if you have a preference certainly one or the other is doable um, but there are strategies for this that you really shouldn't you know, let it run your life and, and um, you know, stress, anxiety, anger, irritability, all of those kind of um, are treated with, with similar um, things that uh, we can certainly facilitate um, from an appointment here. Very true. Mm -hmm. um, well, that's, that's my list. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, I don't know, do you want to talk about fantasy football or something? Oh my god, you can talk about whatever same, you, you know? want, Tom. You can talk about whatever you want. No, no, <laughs> Anything else to say to either your patients or listeners who may be your patients or anybody for the greater good? Um, <clears throat> let's see here, i got a couple weeks left. Um, we got a new doctor, Dr. Goldhammer, I think we talked about him. Um, he seems like a pretty reasonable guy. Um, yeah, uh, you know, providers move from time to time, and you just got to uh, kind of pivot, and, and, and um, I've, I've been recommending people, um, different providers to different patients, you know, but you know, um, the facility isn't going away. So um, certainly, you know, continue to, to come in at your regular, um, you know, kind of intervals that you've been doing, and, um, you know, keep up with that, and and uh, you know there's always going to be change but um, it's a great facility don't forget you know you don't have to go elsewhere it's it's got a lot of things that can be done here it really is a diamond in the rough i mean you just don't come across places like this in rural areas honestly um, so we encourage people to to keep frequenting here um, got a good cafeteria i like food on there and good stuff well, thank you, Tom. It's been fun. And if you want to make an appointment or learn more about anything 
that Tom has talked about in this final episode featuring him, you can call the clinic at 507-836-6153. That's 507-836-6153.